over the summer, I clearly am a um, facilities engineering technology major. I worked at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and I'm going to give you like a bit introduction about our research and what I worked on and some takeaways. So over this past summer, I did my research on high performance supercapacitors from solution process composites at the molecular foundry. So a bit about background is why this is important. So currently, the US is trying to switch from uh, fossil fuels into renewable energies. And we could see over here that this is a US electrical demand. And this is demand on fossil fuels. So in the morning, the demand is low, but later on, Towards the evening, the demand starts increasing. That's where more of it's being produced. Over here, we have some renewable energy, such as solar energy. So this is the net energy uh, graph. So we can see that 12 a.m. to 6 a.m., it's really stable. But then during the daytime, that's when the demand, the net demand decreases because there's so much more solar energy being produced. Later on in day, there's a quick drop off. So that means the, sol the sun has gone down and there's not enough power to go around. Let's give a background on what capacitors are. So essentially, they're governed by C equals epsilon naught A over D. C is capacitance, A is its area, D is its distance between the two parallel plates. So our objective is to increase the area or decrease the distance between the two parallel plates. So we can see over here, one side will hold the uh, positive charges and one side will hold the negative charges. And that essentially is creating a potential difference that's a way of storing energy. Where do supercapacitors lie on relative to other power storage components? So we can see like conventional batteries, the power density is fairly low, but then the energy density is really high. So essentially, supercapacitors combine capa conventional capacitors, which has high power density, but uh, low energy density with conventional batteries, which has high energy density, but low power density. So essentially, um, power density is how much oomph it has, how much power you could uh, provide to something. Energy density is how much capacity it has in total. And over here is our supercapacitor. That's what we're trying to shoot for and also improve. So the idea is with supercapacitors, we want to create energy banks for the solar, wind, and renewable energies. So this will help for demands during the day. When the demand dies down, we want to provide a boost. So when the sun dies down, we have energies resupplied to our grid storage. And here are some benefits of supercapacitors and based on their discharge duration, such as if you have a quick release, you get voltage frequency regulation, you get transient smoothing, reactive power control. And just a bit more information is it's kind of like you don't want dirty oscillations through voltages or else it'll really damage your equipment. So this is uh, one of the more modern technologies currently uh, in San Diego. So essentially, this is a storage unit. But this storage unit is basically, think about your cell phone batteries all combined together. So that's currently what we're at right now. And our next, our improvement, what we want to do is to have super capacity instead of just conventional batteries. The maintenance, the cost, and just like having in there is really expensive over a long duration of time. And capacitors, on the other hand, it's cheaper to make, has longer life cycle, and it's also more safe to use. So this is our experiment proposal. So I'm going to get this a bit technical. So we're trying to manipulate the capacitor plates on the nanoscale, microscale, so something really small instead of on the macro. And then the idea is to combine two materials into something that looks like this, almost like a labyrinth. So by doing this, increases the surface area, and that's one of the things we need to increase capacitance, as I talked about earlier. Then the idea is we take two materials, or two phases, that aren't really consistent with each other and combine them together. So by doing that, we get spinodal morphology, so we get the most surface area out of combining two really different phases. So from the beginning, so this, we chose these two materials for investigation. PCBM and P.PSS. So I decided to give like a little layman term on what this means. So electron carrier, so that basically is your wallet. That's your power. That's what you have. Then your dope hole conducting polymer is your pocket. So you're putting your wallet into your pocket. That's basically storing energy to spend, right? Because on the other hand, if we have batteries, it's actually like affecting the molecular compound. So you're actually putting stress on the bonds and you're 
straining it, expanding, and decompressing it. So over time, will break down. Then capacitors, on the other hand, you could take your wallet out as many times as you want. So it has a much longer life cycle, theoretically. So about creating capacitor samples, this is our first step after choosing material. We synthesized composite materials P.PSS and PCBM, created a mixture between them. Then we chose to drop cast the composite solutions to substrate. Basically, you take a pipette, put it onto a core substrate piece, so basically a piece of glass, and we put the solution on top. Our next step is to thermally anneal it, so we dry it and also have a nice morphology, to kind of smooth it out during using a hot plate. And then our next step was to create gold contacts on it. So this part was really cool. So imagine you're evaporating water, but instead of water, it's gold. You gotta play with big money. <laughs> <laughs> so basically for gold contacts, that's basically where we put our um, basically voltmeter onto it. Not necessarily your voltmeter, but that's the cheaper version. So in order to, later on, so by, after creating gold contacts, we could see that it kind of looks like this over here. Here's some visual observations we made using the Gemini scanning electron microscope. And then again, this is really expensive technology. And it was really cool to be able to use like technology where, whereas like if I wasn't there, it'd be like electron microscope you find in chem lab. But we can see like spun cast. This is a really smooth, a really smooth uh, morphology versus drop cast. We can see like the differences between the surface area. This is like protruding in that 10 micrometer sort of area versus this one, you don't really see as much uh, crystalline shapes in here. So that's what I did over the summer, and then we're currently working on actually finding, using the data, actually um, finding definitive proof. So this is my takeaway is I really learned a lot by being among like a lot of world-class scientists at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, specifically in Melcare Foundry. I feel like I wouldn't have the opportunity to be really able to apply a lot of academic skills I learned at Cal Maritime into theoretical, and that was really cool. cool. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jordan. I'm a second class cadet, and I'm gonna talk about concentric indexing. So this is the bridge sim that we uh, worked on and we're stationed in Tacoma, Washington. You can see the radar right there. So a long time ago, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, Mr. Yeah. Beezy. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the <laughs> would navigate using visual references such as buoys, which are aids to navigation. Throughout a turn, they would use these buoys to know how close or how far away they could get from land. Over here, you can see that if a vessel came through here, they would keep the green to their port side. If they're going into their berthing, keep the red buoys to their, to their right side. So this is a chart that we used, and this line is our first leg, and that's the course that we would steer to begin with. And then the second line, is right there and there's a buoy right here which is a precautionary area buoy you want to keep it to your port side because we're going northbound and so this is the northbound traffic lane and ships have to stay in that lane to prevent any accidents or any issues with other vessels that are going southbound and they the southbound would be in the top lane so what we do is we look for the half mile on our track from the latitude and longitude to figure out where we want to start our turn and how we want the turn to come out. And then here's your radar. And to start off making your concentric index, you need everything else closed out. So down here, there's options such as PI, which is parallel index, and other tools. You have to have all of those closed before you can even start doing the off-center variable range bearing. And then, so once you have found your latitude and longitude of where you want your circle to be, you can click off-center, and then that puts your cursor on the radar screen, and then you drop the middle of your circle onto the screen. At that point, you get to this image where it tells you that it has been dropped and it's anchored in place. Now it's not, not going to move and that's what it looks like. 
So at that point, this is in our turn. This is our vessel. And we have, before we got underway, we put up parallel index lines, which, which are these here. This is for our second course, and this one's for our first course. During this turn, we see that we're inside our circle, and so we know that we're turning too soon, and so we want to take a little way off of our rudder, and we know that through the rudder angle indicator. So when the conning officer is driving, they tell their helmsman, who has their hands on the wheel, that they want to go right 20. At that point, the helmsman will turn their rudder, and the conning officer can see the rudder angle change. And then, as you turn, your rate of turn changes. And the more your rate of turn is, the harder you're turning over. So coming to the end of our turn, we notice we're, we've, we're really far off of our circle. And that means that we weren't hard enough over to maintain on the concentric index. And so we want to put a little more on. This dot right there is a precautionary area buoy that I told you about that we want to keep to our port side. So we put a little more rudder angle on and we're able to make out the turn, leaving the buoy on our port side. And you can see us coming in line with our second parallel index. And that's it. <laughs> So for those of you that don't know, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, goes off the coast of California and conducts fishery surveys, meaning they catch fish, count the fish, so that way it better informs national policy. I had an opportunity to take part in this cruise with them, but I was focused on the underlying ocean conditions that support the fish. And that's kind of what I'm going to get into, is I wasn't counting the fish, I was more looking at data. So before I get into it, I want to acknowledge everyone who supported me through this. Dean Meyer, Dr. Parker, the President, Dr. Kamdar, Coast, and of course, Noah. So this is what it's like on board the ship. They do all the fish catches at night. They are unloading the fish troll to uh, drop the net into the water, and then they sail for a couple miles and then pull it back up and count the fish. This is called the wet lab where they do the counting and this is kind of what it looks like. They pour all the fish out into buckets and they're sorting through them left and right and they catch a number of organisms that aren't just fish like this one and we have some fun along the way. <laughs> but we also catch things like jellyfish or other strange organisms called salps. Now Again, I wasn't in the wet lab. I was mostly out on the deck working with this device here called the CTD. It gets lowered through the water column at specific stations or uh, geospatial points out at sea. We lower it through the water column and it records various conditions in the water, temperature, salinity, pressure, and anything else that we want it to. Granted, we attach a specific sensor to it. So why is going out there and looking at these underlying ocean conditions important to the fish, while well, everyone has seen some sort of cartoon of a food web. This one shows you from the very bottom of the food web, which these are all phytoplankton, those are plant-like organisms that you can't see with your eye, that grow and then feed smaller organisms, which then feed the bigger organisms all the way up to the fish and the sharks and the things that we care about. So what makes these guys grow you, for one thing, need a lot of sunlight. They're like plants. They have chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll is what they use to grow. You need nutrients, and the temperature conditions have to be right. And so off the coast of California, we have a very unique situation where we have what's called coastal upwelling, where really nutrient-rich deep water comes up to the surface because of the way that currents and the wind move in the northern hemisphere. This water down at the bottom of the ocean comes up and it's full of nutrients that these phytoplankton can now use to grow. And the, uh, these blue areas off the coast of California are really cold waters. That shows you where all the coastal upwelling is happening. Just north of San Francisco, just north of Monterey Bay, and just south of Monterey Bay. Now, when there's a lot of nutrients there and the conditions are especially right, the phytoplankton can bloom. And that's what this looks like from satellite. 
This is just to give you an idea of how many are in the water and that they can grow to extraordinary sizes. So going out and doing this research, we have the hypothesis that the underlying ocean conditions are going to positively influence the fish that they are studying. And I wanted to concentrate this in Monterey Bay because all along the coast, that is where I had the most data points. And it's, of course, a very unique area. So all of these red dots are points that NOAA has gone and looked at and said, these are places that we want to come back to every year and survey. So that's what we did. And this is data that I'd collected. This represents temperature in Monterey Bay. This is the surface waters. And as you can see, this cold blob right here, that's the coastal upwelling that we see. And then there's warmer waters offshore. But this cold water is coming up from the bottom. Now this is a measurement of the chlorophyll, those small phytoplankton in the water at the surface. You don't see many of them over where the coastal upwelling is happening because the nutrients has just had a chance to come up to the surface. So they're not exactly growing. It takes time for them to grow. So then we start to see them a little bit offshore. Now, the fish, the thing that Noah is caring about, this was a significant find for them, the northern anchovies, because out of 30 years, this year they had the highest recorded number of northern anchovies off the coast of California. And that was very significant to them. As you can see, the yellow triangle is the Monterey Bay region. We call that central northern California coastal area. And that is the highest it has ever been in the last 30 years. Now, we also looked at chlorophyll A that are specifically in the larger cells of the phytoplankton. There's small phytoplankton, there's big phytoplankton, but overall they're really small. And to give you an idea of that, this is a hair follicle. Well, so you could kind of see this is 10, the, the 10 right there, there are five. So think of half of that line and then compare that to your hair follicle. They're really small. And we found those at the highest concentrations within Monterey Bay. And things that eat those guys are really important and so that would be things like market squid. These are sold on the commercial fish market. You see them as calamari in, in restaurants and whatnot. But we also saw a lot of jellyfish. And the jellyfish were actually so significant that there were three points in Monterey Bay where there were just so many jellyfish that they didn't feel safe deploying the nets because it would have destroyed their gear. There were just that many jellyfish. So the coloring on this chart is actually wrong in the sense that this would be very, very red, very red, and very red. But we just couldn't deploy the nets there because there were too many. So what does this all mean in the end? Well, we found that the underlying conditions of the ocean are indicating coastal upwelling. That's point number one. Number two is that because of the coastal upwelling and the phytoplankton bloom, there are record catches of northern anchovies. Again, looking back at the food web, you see the phytoplankton that are growing, supporting the food web. And when there's a lot of the phytoplankton, there's going to be a lot of fish higher up on the food web. So a lot of the northern anchovies. And because of the jellyfish and the market squid really feeding on those larger chlorophyll sizes, and they were found at higher, the very high concentrations within Monterey Bay, we see that they were responding to that as well. So with all of this data, I'm taking it to Planet Water. It's a conference put on by the Association of Science in Limnology and Oceanography. It's a conference being held down in Puerto Rico. I'm gonna take all of this data and share it with some colleagues out there. Any questions? Over my past two summers, I've done research into computational quantum chemistry, um, and I really enjoyed it. So I'll get on to a little bit about what this is. So first off, it's important to explain why I'm studying quantum chemistry and what's so important about it. So really, quantum chemistry is a study of electron interaction and to see how electrons interact with each other and with other particles. And this really gives us a deeper understanding of the nature of reality and matter and chemical reactions. So, um, and this gives us an ability to develop new technologies, such as laser pointer, for example. So this laser pointer, how do they work? Well, uh, basically they work through the um, transition of electrons in 
atomic in atoms from an excited levels to lower levels. And then when they go through this transition, they release a photon of light. And you can uh, select the atom, and you can select the incident photon energy to kind of choose the resulting photon energy that comes out. And the energy of this photon really determines like, the color of the light, the intensity, yeah, the, the type of light that comes out. And this photon, uh, the energy of the photon is equal to the difference in energy between the two levels of the electron when it transitions from an excited state to a lower state. So laser pointers are cool, but even more important to kind of the development of humanity is the development of the transistor, which led us to the computer. So interestingly enough, my research also uses computers. So basically, what my research was on is I took a quantum chemical system, and then I solved problems on a computer in order to get answers from them. So here we have a picture of Edison, which is a supercomputer at NERSC at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And this is a supercomputer that I used to do some of my work. So I would send in some code. It would solve it and spit out some things like this matrix here. So this, this is kind of like a representation of the matrices that I would solve. And you can see it's a really nice structure. These white areas are kind of like empty spaces on the matrix where there's zeros. And that allows it to be much easier to solve other equations. And each processor actually solves one of these kind of square blocks in the matrix. So the use of the supercomputer is you can use parallel processors to make it compute much faster instead of just running it all on one, um, your like home computer or something. But this actually has over 400,000 cores compared to your personal computer, which has like eight cores. So it's much faster. <laughs> so the problem I worked on specifically is called double photoionization. And basically what this is, is we have a photon with a certain amount of energy, which can be described by H nu. And this photon of energy collides with a target. In my cases, I was focusing on photoionization of helium and then molecular hydrogen, which is just two hydrogen atoms. So when this photon of energy hits this target, we're interested in what happens when two electrons are ejected from the target. So it's kind of like you throw a ball at something, it hits it, and it explodes. And we're looking at the explosion. And this kind of gives a formula for how this reaction occurs. We have a, a molecule of hydrogen. We shoot a photon at it, and it releases two electrons, and also two protons, which are left behind, which are kind of like the ionized remains of the molecule. And the, what's important to note is these electrons are going to be moving much, much faster than these protons are, because the electrons are so much smaller. Um, so we can approximate that um, in our calculations using something using the Born-Oppenheim approximation, and that allows us to make our calculations easier. So I'm focusing on how the electrons interact with each other and they're, as they're ejected out from this process. So here's kind of experimentally how they do it, because that was just kind of like theoretical. So this is called a Coltrim's spectroscopy device. And what it does is basically we have a gas jet right here, and it shoots out a little molecule or target of which you're trying to inspect the double photonization of. And we shoot a photon of light, which comes and hits this target. And then using magnetic fields produced by these and electric fields produced by these coils, you can kind of orient the particles as they're ejected to hit these two detectors. And then when they hit these two detectors, we can use the amount of time it took for the particle to hit the detector, and also where the particle hit the detector. So like where on the uh, detector the particle hits. And from that, we can determine the ex kind of the dynamics of the explosion to like, like kinetic energies and stuff and what have you over the explosion when it happens. So that's how they do it experimentally, but how do we do it on the computer? So in essence, what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve for this size scattered, which is basically a function, if you will. And we're solving it in something called a Schrodinger equation. So what we're doing is it's basically equivalent to a matrix equation, which you would solve via regular linear algebra techniques. And so we kind of put this size scattered in this equation. And what's going on is here we have what we're trying to solve for, which is kind of represents the electrons as they're coming out. And this is the scattered wave electron wave function. We have the energy of the initial kind of bound states of the target. So in the case of H2, it would be the energies of the bound states of H2. And that's associated with the, and this, this kind of represents the bound states of H2. And then we have the energy of the incident photon. And we have something called the Hamiltonian, which is basically this matrix that I was solving for earlier in the supercomputers. And it kind of describes the interactions of the charged particles during this collision. And the right side here kind of just shows what's happening before the impact happens. It just kind of describes the light and the state of the system before the light impacts the, the target. So this is the scattered wave function after I solve for it. And it looks kind of daunting, but it's kind of, kind of interesting to explain. So what's going on is here's the origin at 0, 0. And this is where the impact happens. So this is where we're centering our kind of frame of reference for our problem. 
and the light hits it, and then these are, this kind of represents the electrons as they're coming out of the explosion. So what we're interested in is the middle part right here, which kind of represents the portions of the uh, wave where both electrons are ejected from the collision, because in quantum mechanics, nothing is guaranteed, and it's all based on probability. And there's also a chance that only one electron is ejected instead, and the other just gets stuck and is still bound to the molecule or the atom. So these wavelengths, or these waveforms coming out parallel to these axes here, represent the chance that only one electron is ejected uh, with a really high kinetic energy, and the other electron remains bound inside of the atom. Um, and what we're interested in is when both electrons are ejected, because when we kind of investigate the situations when both electrons are ejected, we can see how they talk to each other and how they interact with each other and determine more about kind of the fundamentals of physics from this, these interactions. Interesting to note is that the amplitudes of the parts where only one electron is ejected is greater, is much greater in fact, than when both electrons are ejected, which shows us that the chance of one electron being ejected is much higher. And this also makes it difficult when we solve these numerically because because the parts where one electron is ejected is higher in amplitude, it has much higher contributions of one electron being ejected, and that makes us have to be very careful in the way we formulate our problem, because if we're not accurate enough, we could get some contamination from these single electrons into our investigation of the double electron ejection. So these are kind of the results that I've determined from my results. Um, so this kind of gives an example of how the when both electrons are ejected, the energy that they share kind of between each other in relation to the total energy. So this vertical axis here is the cross section. It basically just gives like a description of how much energy, or it's, it's uh, in units of um, area divided by energy, but it kind of just shows how much energy one electron has. And this bottom axis here is the energy of one electron with respect to the total energy of the system. So because of quantum mechanics, we can't really assign uh, distinction to one electron or the other electron. So that's why when you look at this energy curve, you see that one electron being ejected has, is kind of, it's kind of like uh, flipped vertically because the chance of one electron being ejected is kind of the same as the other electron being ejected. You can't really tell the difference between the two. And what's interesting to note is these waves or these oscillations here, these are caused by contamination of our double ionization amplitude here by the single ionization amplitude when we run our calculations on it. So we don't want these oscillations because they kind of throw off our results and make non-physical. So my research kind of focused on getting rid of these oscillations and making it much easier to get this black line here, which is what we want. And then you can see after I do my, my techniques and stuff, and we're able to get rid of most of the oscillations, which gets rid of most of the contamination from the single ionization channels. And yeah, so I want to acknowledge my group at LBL that I worked with, and Frank. Uh, he mentored me a lot, and I really appreciate it. And the visiting faculty program for sponsoring me for working at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is a Department of Energy program. So thank you. My name is Carson Alexander. I'm in my junior year studying mechanical engineering here at Cal Maritime. And I'm Nora Anastasi. I'm a freshman and I'm an MET here at Cal Maritime. And this is our project on wind-driven wave turbulence. What are we measuring? Well, we are measuring wind-driven waves. Wind-driven waves are very different from current waves or tide waves. Wind-driven waves are powered purely from wind. And we're taking the data we collect from these wind-driven waves and we we're able to make observations on wind-driven turbulence out in the bay. Turbulence is just the disruption of the water. And from observations we can make on this turbulence, we are able to figure out sort of the dynamics of local mixing. So uh, in order to get those measurements basically on those surface wind-driven dynamics basically of those waves, we need instrumentation in order to take those measurements. So probably the most important piece of this is right there, which is an inertial measurement unit, or an IMU. So basically what that does is if we have that IMU on the surface of the water, we can catch those movements of those wind-driven waves. So in the next slide, I'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the data we can get with the IMU, but basically what that does is that allows us, as it's moving, it can export data. So what we did is we wired that up to, as you can see right here, an Arduino microcontroller a pretty user-friendly microcontroller. We were basically able to use, there's, a, there's some of the program from the manufacturer and also a program 
that we edited and downloaded basically onto the Arduino. So we can provide an external power source once the program is on the Arduino, and then it just continuously runs. So what happens is it takes that, it reads the data that the IMU is producing, and it sends it to this micro SD reader. So what, in theory, what we can do is we can leave this IMU out on the surface for uh, a couple days or however long we need to basically read data, and it continuously writes it to that SD card, and later we can look at that and analyze the data. So here's a couple of graphs of the kind of data that we got from the IMU. So far, this is just literally us taking the IMU and like shaking it around, because we, ha we haven't put it out in the water yet. But as you can see, so what we get from here, this graph, we get our linear acceleration. So along each of the axes, the, the amount the uh, IMU is moving along those axes. So, and we also get the Euler angles. So the amount the IMU differentiates from those axes in degrees. So basically, while we combine, we combine both of that data and it gives us absolute orientation along the water. So that's kind of the benefit of the IMU. And really, the point of our research is to see if we can use this relatively cheap IMU to basically pr produce like usable data about the, the wave dynamics. So in order to basically have this IMU on the surface of the water, we need a way for it to float and not get wet. So as you can see right here, this is the housing we have. Pretty simple, basically just a piece of PVC pipe with two caps on it. But the benefit of that is, is it's pretty, pretty cheap, it's waterproof, and it floats really well. But an issue with that is once we put all the, the IMU inside there and close it, it's going to want to float basically how it's sitting like that, and it's just going to turn, and that data is basically useless. So what we need is we need the IMU to be flat, at least at the start, and we can put it, as here I did a SOLIDWORKS rendering of kind of our proposed idea, so we can put the IMU basically flat in there, and we have right here, it's like an aluminum rod with a weight on the bottom. So we still need to do a fluid analysis of this and see what the basically optimum length of this rod is along with the best weight for this weight. So, because we want to lower that center of mass so the float sits upright, and as the waves come along, it moves with the waves. So we kind of have to find that sweet spot so where it's not too low in the water where the waves come over and don't move it. Or, and we also don't want it to be oscillating around where the data is useless. So like I said earlier, really the point, this, these IMUs haven't really been used to capture data like this before. So our, our goal is to see if we can construct this, this housing and put the IMU in there. And as those surface wind-driven waves come along, it'll move this and hopefully we can get useful data to use by uh, oceanographers. Why it matters, why do this? Well, <clears throat> our goal is to make observations about the waves in the bay. And what's nice about our IMUs is that they're easily made, easily bought, they're very cheap, they're very easy to use, and we can potentially deploy quite a few out to collect more data and make more observations in different areas in the bay and the estuary. And what is really good about having these observations is it really sets a great groundwork for further research and further observations that are made in the bay because there aren't a lot of research done on this type of thing in the bay. So yeah, I guess we want to talk a little bit about why we did undergraduate research. So personally for me, I, I did just so I could kind of apply some of the things I learned in my classes. So I've been able to use what I learned in instrumentation, auto feedback, and fluid mechanics a little bit to really kind of use what I learned instead of maybe just doing like a test or homework. It's actually using what you learn to further research. You get to work really closely with your professors and, and actually learn a lot more. And I do undergraduate research because as a freshman, I am not completely aware of my options and what is out there. And through this, I really got a whole new side shown to me of research and what our degree can do in that direction. And it also offered me a great opportunity to work with my peers, work with my professors, and get um, a really good hands-on experience for what we're learning here at Cal Maritime. So all this would not be possible without funding from Coast. So as you can see, all that we have all those electronics, all the you know, PVC pipe or whatever. So all that Coast basically funds all, all of what we need, the instrumentation, whatever we need to make this research possible. And also, Nora and I both 
work closely with a professor, uh, myself with Dr. Oppenheim. He helps me out whenever, whenever I have a question on the, the coding or anything I'm confused about, I can go to him, ask him a question, we bounce ideas off each other. And I worked closely with Dr. Safuentes. He really introduced me to research and showed me that that's something that I'm actually very passionate about. And he's been extremely helpful, very supportive, and I've learned a lot from him. So, any questions? <laughs>